Okay. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, this is Elena Hyde from the AEO It's So office. Um, you may know me from such things as the uh, Gemini Cosmic Pole, and the Gemini office has very kindly agreed to um, do a live at Gemini event so that we can see what's going on inside um, Gemini Telescope. Now I'm going to hand over to Peter Michaud et al. and the crew. Um, thank you very much for doing this. Well, thanks for putting this all together and uh, welcome to the Gemini Observatory Northern Base Facility Control Room. I'm sitting here with Andre Nikolai Cheney, who is one of our uh, staff astronomers at uh, Gemini, and he's going to be helping us uh, answer any questions um, and uh, chat a little bit about what happens uh, from uh, our control room down here in uh, sunny Hilo, Hawaii. I say sunny Hilo, Hawaii, because oftentimes it's rainy Hilo, Hawaii, uh, or the rainiest city in the United States. Which, so you wouldn't think that would be the best place for an observatory, but uh, fortunately the telescope is not here in Hilo. It's up on near the top of Mauna Kea, uh, near the center part of the island at almost 14,000 feet, uh, over 4,000, what about 4,500 meters. Um, and uh, so it's above all the clouds and uh, gets a very high percentage of clear, beautiful, pristine weather for observing the universe. We're going to talk about that today and um, give you a little tour of our facilities here um, with some, some pictures and some of the things, some of the types of things that we uh, study at the Gemini Observatory. And uh, again, it all happens from here at the Gemini North base facility. We have a similar facility in Chile as well because Gemini, we have two, uh, it's called Gemini because we have two telescopes, twin telescopes, uh, one in Hawaii and the other in Chile. So they're on both sides of the equator and we can see uh, the, the whole sky that way. So thank you, uh, Peter. Actually, yeah. that's a great place for one of our first questions from the listserv. Um, yeah. We actually got asked about the primary mirror on Gemini and how big that is and what kind of mirror you use. Okay, well, that's a very good question. Andre, Nicolai, do you want to take that one? To, um, or I can. Do, they, do you use meter in, in, in Australia? <laughs> it's 8.2 meter in diameter. Um, that would be the equivalent of a um, fairly big storage room. About the size of a typical classroom is, yeah, is pretty, classroom. Uh, a school classroom is a good, good uh, comparison. What type of glass? Um, I don't know if you have a lot of details about that. Well, it's, it's made out of, uh, it's made, it was made at uh, uh, Corning Glass in New York State, in the United States, and it's a type of, um, um, actually it's a ceramic material uh, called ultra low expansion glass, but it's more of a ceramic, but uh, uh, it weighs about 24 uh, tons. So yeah, it's only about um, 10 inches thick. So it's not very thick. And because of that, it can't really support its own weight. And so it um, uh, needs what are called actuators to nudge it back into shape uh, to keep its shape right. And the shape has to be precise to within about somewhere between one one thousandth and one ten thousandth the thickness of a, of a typical human hair. That's how precise the whole surface. Uh, you know, 8.1 meters across and about 27 feet for uh, the metric, the metric challenged out there uh, in the United States. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so it's a, a pretty, pretty good sized chunk of glass. <laughs> and its sole purpose is to hold a thin, thin, thin layer of silver, protected silver, uh, about the amount of silver that you would find in a U.S. dime. Um, I don't know, Elena, maybe you can compare that to an Australian coin. I'm not as familiar with Australian coins. Um, but that amount of, lumina, of, lumina, uh, of, of silver, I'm sorry, is spread out over the whole mirror. And its only purpose, like I said, that glass is to, to, to support that um, very small amount of, of silver that reflects the starlight. Yeah, great. Well, that's about, um, I guess, a five-cent piece here in Australia. Australia. Um, I think they're almost exactly the same size. Okay, I believe. Um, very <laughs> thin layer. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> um, great, great answer. Okay, so what I think we'll do now is I've got a couple of slides uh, to show. Let me see if I can figure out how to make these um, play for you here. Oops. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I did that too early. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go share screen. share screen and then we're going to click on that. I'll click over here, then we'll play. Okay, can you see the can you see the movie? 
Yes, we can see the movie. It looks great. What is it? Okay, this is the Gemini North telescope uh, at night. Uh, as a time lapse showing uh, things moving along more quickly than you'd normally see them from the outside. Now we're on the inside though, uh, and this is showing the telescope. The telescope's about seven stories high. Just to give you a sense of scale, it's kind of hard to tell how big that is. Um, and it's looking out of the slit there. And again, the mirror is about eight meters across, about 27 feet across. So you can get a sense of just how, how, how big things are um, up there in, uh, at the up on Mauna Kea and in Chile. The, the two telescopes are almost identical. Uh, now the moon is setting in the sky and you can see things getting dark and then, oops, the sun's gonna come up. So it's a nearly full moon. Now we're back, oh, okay, I'll keep bouncing back and forth. This is looking at Mauna Kea here on the big island of Hawaii uh, from a mountain called Mauna Loa. And this is a time-lapse sequence um, that I did many, many, many years ago. Um, I sat up there all day long and took a picture about every 30 seconds uh, to show how the clouds move over time. Uh, and you can see that the clouds sort of stay at a certain level. It's called the inversion layer, where it sort of caps the top of the clouds most of the time. Okay, the sun's setting now in the video, and it's going to get dark. Oops, now the moon comes up and is lighting things up again. So you can see uh, the clouds stay down there nice and low. They're very well behaved and they keep away from the telescopes up on the top of the mountain. And uh, you can see a few lights up there. Oh, and then, uh, then we have the sky. Oh, we're back where we started from again. So, <laughs> so this is the telescope again at night, what it looks like at night. You see those big things on the side? Those are the vent gates that allow the air to flow through so that uh, we get the... the uh, Peter, thanks. Uh, this looks really, really great. But um, some of us, I think, might be getting a frozen video. And I just want to say if anyone seeing a, a frozen screen um, the the live video will show in the recording because that's coming from Peter's screen okay so um, let's move on <laughs> um, but I actually have a great question related to this oh, okay. so um, from our listserv we have a, a question from somebody asking how does the telescope know where to go so you show hmm that's a good well you lose her are you still there Elena? Okay. Okay, I guess you're back. Yes, sorry oh. about that. Okay. Uh, the internet um, problems. Yeah. But the question yeah. was, how does the telescope know where to go? Sorry about that again. Well, Andre Nikolai is a perfect person to answer that one. There is, um, okay, first you have to uh, keep in mind that the uh, Gemini Observatory is a public observatory open for um, all the people living in the partner countries to proposed for time. And because it's a professional uh, observatory, it's expected to be um, observing um, objects that will push the forefront knowledge of what, uh, what we know about astronomy. So every, or periodically, there will be call for a proposal. So everybody's invited to send in the proper form um, a request for time to the telescope. And this goes through um, a committee made of uh, peer astronomers that evaluate each request, each proposal, rank them, and find ways to fit that in the future schedule for the coming year or the coming semester, depending on the time scale for these uh, processes. And uh, once we have selected the programs, they, may, they are made ready and they are scheduled every night. So for, um, in preparation of every night, we take the big bank of projects that were uh, given time for the coming year. And each night we see which of these programs are the best fits for the night coming. Uh, not all the um, uh, objects can be uh, seen at all times. Some objects are for the winter time, some objects are, are for the summer time. So depending on where you are in the year, depending on the night that is coming, you are selecting the programs that are the best fit for the night coming. You make a schedule and this is, um, this is this, the schedule that will be followed by the observer who decides, let's point, to that object and then when the, this subject is selected based on the schedule which is made based on the programs accepted that comes from all the requests from the people in the partner countries okay and then and where we're sitting right now is where they press the buttons uh, <laughs> uh, virtual buttons on the computer to uh, make the telescope go where it needs to go and make sure that we're getting the right data and we're down here in Hilo it's about oh it takes about an hour and a half to get here up to the top of the mountain 
Um, and uh, we've just started operating remotely where we do everything from down here and uh, with nobody on, the, on uh, up at the telescope on the mountain. So that's a big step for us and uh, not an easy step either. And so that it all happens from right here. Uh, in fact, uh, they'll be, um, if they haven't already, start calibrating the instruments for tonight. It's about uh, um, a little after four in the afternoon here. And so we're getting ready to observe tonight. And so there are uh, staff people who have already looked at what we expect the conditions to be tonight and have made a, a first shot at that, the list of observations for tonight, which could change if the conditions change, yep, uh, and then backups and, and, and uh, so that we get the, the best use of our time on the telescope because the telescope time on a telescope, uh, telescope like Gemini is very, very valuable. <laughs> and if you lose 15, 20 minutes, it may not sound like much, um, but um, it's a valuable resource and we don't want to lose any time uh, <laughs> if, if, if possible. And so it, it, it is very highly choreographed. It's not just like, oh, let's go over here and look at this tonight. Oh, isn't that pretty? Let's look at that. Uh, <laughs> if you're an amateur astronomer, you can do that. Professional astronomers, uh, they know exactly what they're going to look at, when they're going to look at it, and um, it's, it's, it's very, very highly planned. One of the things that we've been discussing um, on our, our cosmic pole um, listserv is walking people through a little bit of how that happens using RA and declination, which are like a longitude and latitude for positions of objects. And because you guys are actually in Hawaii, one of the things that we told them is um, in Hawaii, you can actually, you're actually able to see a different part of the sky that we here in Australia are able to see. Um, so that's also something to to keep in mind um, when you're when you're thinking about um, how does the, the telescope um, know where to go? Well, even once you've, you've picked your your object and you have it in the sky, you also have to think about where you are on Earth because where you guys have it available to you is going to be different than what we have here in Australia. Yeah, here in Hawaii, we're at about twenty degrees north latitude, so we're. Uh, very close to the equator, obviously. We're in the tropics. Um, and uh, because of that, we can see almost the entire sky. Now, with a telescope like Gemini, uh, we typically don't look at things that are very, very low in the sky because you're looking through a lot more atmosphere when you do that. Um, and so that's why having a telescope in Chile allows us to optimize uh, the instruments that we use for looking at the sky and the geographical position, um, which determines where they are in the sky so we can, we can maximize our, our uh, time on the sky. Um, let me just show you where the two telescopes are uh, in Chile and Hawaii, um, approximately where those arrows landed as I went through, and that's what the telescopes look like. And if you look at the two domes, they look very similar to each other, and they are. Um, it's sort of an economy of scale in building two identical telescopes <laughs> instead of trying to make each one different, uh, because we could um, learn from the first one and, and, and apply it to the second one. And so we share a lot of uh, people, too. For example, about every six years or so, we have to recoat the mirror. And so when we do that, staff from, the south, from Gemini South will come up to Gemini North and vice versa. And so um, we have about 140 people on our staff at, at, at both sites, um, doing everything from um, scientists like Andre Nikolai here and to technicians, uh, to people like myself doing education and outreach. Um, so we've got an awful lot of types of, of, of jobs at the observatory. So any kids watching this, uh, if you ever want an exciting job, studying to the edges of the universe, observatories are a great place to work. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, talking about uh, where to point where we are on Earth and what, what, how does it matter. Um, here you, you have the two telescopes, so the, the one in Hawaii and the one in Chile, and you can see uh, the donuts, the colored donuts, are uh, essentially the area of the sky that is visible from each one. So from one you can see a bit more than half from the other one, the other half, and using two, you cover pretty much the whole sky. So depending on if you're observing from Chile or from Hawaii, you would, like you just said, uh, point differently, but if you combine both, then you can cover the whole sky. And again, we, got the two we have the two telescopes here, and just I wanted to show you where we are today. We're in the uh, uh, Gemini North um, base facility, uh, and you can see all the flags there, including an Australian flag, if you look real carefully. Uh, <laughs> um, and the um, very common rainbow 
Um, and the, the way that we're funded is that we go, we go to the end of the rainbow over there and we start digging. And when we find that pot of gold, that pays for everything. So <laughs> now it's actually all of those partners that you see there, all of those flags, uh, all contribute money uh, to operate the observatory. And so again, as Andre Nikolai said, any astronomer in any of the partner countries can apply for time. And technically anybody can, but typically astronomers are the only ones that would know how <laughs> <laughs> and be able to make a proposal that would be competitive. Because what happens is when, they, when a proposal comes in, is reviewed by the, uh, their peers. And um, that's how we make the decision as to what gets time and what doesn't get time. It's very competitive. It's almost like getting into an exclusive college. Uh, not all of the proposals get, get time on the telescope. And so we have to be very careful about which ones we choose, the ones that look like uh, most likely to get uh, interesting science uh, results out of them. Oops, we've already done that. So I'm going to move on to... Um, is there, if there, if there, is there any other new question coming? Is there any, any new questions or anything that you want to add, Helen? Uh, yes, there is actually one new question. I was going to save it for a little bit. Um, oh, but actually, we just got a question on Twitter. Um, what's the most unusual thing you guys have seen at the telescope? Hmm, that's a good question. That's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> it, um, I, I suppose it could be a galaxy, but I think it's says more astronomers geared towards strange unusual. things that happen at telescopes. Yeah, <laughs> one of the most unusual things. Um, there, there, there's hardly any uh, easy answer to that question because let's say you have two types of things that can happen. When you're a researcher and you're asking yourself a question about something you don't know and you want to look at, the, uh, at it so you, you may discover how and why, um, you have a plan and then you ask for time to the telescope, the telescope points there and finds something uh, that is either what you expected or not. So when it's what you're ex you, you expected, then you uh, close the loop, uh, you had your original idea that became an hypothesis that you have verified with your data, and then you close the loop saying, well, I was right. This is what I thought, and this is the answer. Uh, and luckily, it happens to many people, but uh, even more luckily, the contrary also happens uh, when you look at it, and it's not like you expect it, and then you have to open to yet more possibilities for uh, what uh, one thing can, can be and how it can go there. So what could be one of the most exciting things um, I don't know if you can think of uh, something. Well, I don't know. One of the things that I find most fascinating is that uh, while well, Gemini uh, performs very well in what's called the time domain, which means that uh, we're very flexible. And if something happens in the sky, uh, we can put the telescope on that object very quickly before it fades away or before it's, it's no longer relevant. One of the areas that I find most fascinating, and it's really boring in terms of what it looks like, but it's really interesting in terms of what it represents. And that's... Um, uh, what are called gamma ray bursts and these are some of the most uh, the most energetic explosions in the universe and they're most distant as well some of them and when we see one of these it's so energetic that we can literally see back to the very beginnings of the universe to an event that happened as much as oh 90 percent of the way back or even further to the to the beginning of the universe and it just looks like a little dot on the on the image but they're very they're uh, transient and, and they don't last very long. And so we need to move fast to capture one of these things. And we've captured a number of these and been able to take the light, and make it uh, and spread it out into a, a rainbow of colors and take a spectrum of it to figure out what's going on um, when, when these events happen. And so something like that, I find, I, I, you know, to be looking back at the universe when it was less than a billion years old, it's about what, uh, 13 point, Four billion, I think, is the current estimate for the age of the universe. Um, you know, we're looking back at the universe when it was a, a, a very youthful, <laughs> and uh, uh, seeing something that happened that far back in time. I, to me, that's that's amazing. And and, and I, I don't want to go go too far into this, but a lot of times when we get questions about, you know, what's the strangest thing we've seen. Um, a lot of times people expect that we'll have seen oh, a UFO yes. or something strange in the sky. And one of the things I find fascinating is the fact that uh, astronomers typically don't see odd things in the sky very often, <laughs> <laughs> or that I really know of at all. Or at all, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Well, it's hard to be unidentified. Well, it is. <laughs> yeah, for all the time astronomers, and even amateur astronomers, spend looking at the time, uh, you rarely meet any that have ever seen anything really that far out of the ordinary that, that can't be explained. Um, so it makes astronomers a little skeptical of some of the claims of <laughs> things that people see in the sky sometimes. So I think people need to get out into the sky and look at it more carefully and, and understand what's up there. And, and um, um, it's, a, it, it's much more fascinating than the... Um, um, than a UFO. <laughs> I, I might just add that um, at the telescope, you know, you always have the chance of discovering something new, which is really, really great um, because you, you might, you know, if you're doing imaging, um, you never know, a new asteroid might fly by or an unidentified comet might fly by or a star might be pulsating that wasn't supposed to be pulsating. Um, and that's always the, the sort of really exciting part, but you also have the telescope itself is a really strange environment, right? Um, uh, I uh, just, for example, um, there's a couple telescopes I went to in the U.S. Um, in Arizona, where they have a bear warnings, and you're walking out um, at about you know four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning, um, you have a chance of encountering a black bear, um, and at five o'clock in the morning, and you know sun's coming up, a bear is actually a very surprising thing to have happen. <laughs> Even when there's a warning sign. Doesn't you guys have any of those? But telescopes themselves are also very strange environments, right? Yeah, one of the things about Mauna Kea um, is it's, it's in Hawaii, and people come here and they say, "Oh, it's in the tropics. It's a you know, it's a beautiful tropical climate." And uh, then they go up. Oh, let's go up on Mauna Kea and see see what that's like. And they have shorts and and and, and uh, flip flop shoes. Um, and they get up there and they find it's a very very different environment. We get um, from about November, about this time of year, through April, sometimes May, we'll have snow on the ground continuously on the mountain. And it's uh, at night it gets below freezing. Um, it's a very difficult environment to work in on the mountain. Uh, and, and part of that is because of uh, the cold temperatures. Cold temperature, high altitude. It's a very unique uh, environment as well. If you visit, uh, if you, you mentioned bear in other observatories here, you would not have anything that big. You would, I mean, the, the, the most of the living forms that are not humans driving up there that you may find there are mostly insects. And there is this little, um, um, how do you call it? Uh, so it's called a bicubog. Yeah, bicubog. Yeah, it's, um, it's I forgot the name, the specific name of the family of this insect, but the point is, it's, a, it's an insect that got specialized in capturing and eating all the insects that were blown by the wind over the top of the mountain. Uh, just in itself, that is pretty uh, interesting. Um, also, we have uh, moths that actually do live in the daytime. So if you're looking for a moth in the nighttime, you won't find any because you have to look at them in the daytime. Um, one thing that is pretty uh, unique uh, on Mauna Kea, and it's not something unexpected because we know it's there. It's a lake. It's the highest lake in the United States. Um, and it, what is very spe special about it is it's not fully um, agreed what is the reason why all the water is retained in that lake. Probably it's due to um, the bedding that is uh, very specific there. And so it retains all the, the rain, uh, the water coming from the rain and the snow melting. Uh, one interesting fact with that is that such high altitude and such a fragile lake is uh, very sensitive to climate changes. And uh, in, in, the, in the current of the last year, uh, this lake was dry for the first time in a long time. Uh, mostly can be per this mostly can be perceived as one of the, fo the first um, clear sign of a change in the clim climate pattern uh, worldwide, but that is mostly uh, affecting first the high altitude sites, and then later all the other sites. Yeah, the more extreme places are probably more more noticeable. sensitive. Yeah. So, um, because we're 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 oh, we're, right, we want to keep things moving. I'm going to uh, just talk a little bit about this uh, collection of, of uh, pictures here. Uh, these pictures that I have on the screen now are images from the past, I think it's five, six years of Australia's uh, student imaging program, similar to what we're doing now, except that uh, in the past we've, we've had uh, students at uh, Australian schools help select targets. And these are some of the images that, have, that were obtained um, over the years uh, by Australian students. And some beautiful images here. If you go to the Gemini webpage, uh, gemini.edu, we can go to our image gallery and see these on there. Um, but um, um, 
this contest is, is uh, uh, or this poll is a continuation of that uh, legacy, that heritage of Australian uh, students and the public uh, participating in astronomy. Yeah, this is really great. Thanks for showing that. That's um, also now we're, we're um, running that through the uh, the ITSO office at the AAO now. Excellent. Good. Good. Okay, very quickly because I do want to get um, uh, get back uh, away from <laughs> these slides and and um, and go to any more questions. But uh, I did want to talk a little bit about some of the types of things that we observe at Gemini. Everything from our solar system. This is an infrared picture of, of course, the planet Saturn. Down below it, you can see Titan down there, one of its moons. And this is another. Uh, you you asked about what some of the um, most interesting things that we that we see, and to me this is fascinating. That, that this is using a, a technology called adaptive optics to get a really sharp view. And if you look at Titan, you can see it's not just a pinpoint like you would see in a small telescope. And one of the first things I looked at when I was a kid through a telescope was Saturn, and it got me hooked for life uh, in astronomy. Um, and, and and Titan looked like a little pinpoint. But with a telescope using adaptive optics as big as Gemini, we see a disk, and we can actually zoom in on that. I don't think. I I did it. Uh, I don't think I have it right here now. But uh, if we zoom in on that, you can actually see weather in the clouds of in the atmosphere of Titan, yeah. and you can see clouds and, and how they develop. And one of the things that we do is monitor that weather to see what's happening um, in terms of the environment uh, on a moon around the planet Saturn. <laughs> and to me, that's just magic that we can do that. <laughs> um, also, a very very um, uh, big initiative at Gemini is, is, is looking for planets around other stars or exoplanets. And this is one of the recent discoveries of an exoplanet. Um, and um, Andre Nicola, do you want to say anything more about this? Or? Well, I can uh, essentially say that this is made available by, um, the, um, by pushing the technology to its uh, very limit of what we can do right now and and we can only do better by pushing it even further so to achieve that you have to have very clean optics you have to have very clean very controlled environment in your instruments and in on the telescope so um this is oh you, you probably have a very good image to uh, compare the challenge this represents but this is equivalent to something like uh, looking at a firefly next to a searchlight a searchlight yeah, yeah. Uh, from, the, from a very long distance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So look, looking for planets around other stars obviously is something that is is a very oh, popular topic uh, with the public and with astronomers too, because we're finding that uh, planets seem to be everywhere. Um, you know, we can only see them around stars that are relatively close to us in space, because the planets are pretty faint compared to their stars. And one of the things you see in this picture here is that the star itself is blocked out to um, eliminate some of the glare, it's called a coronagraph, or an, uh, it has what's called an occulting disk that blocks out part of the star and allows the, star, the planets to be visible. And so we've discovered uh, several planets now with Gemini di by directly imaging them. There are other ways of finding planets uh, that are more indirect, but by directly imaging, that's very difficult to do. And we use that technology again called adaptive optics to get really sharp views so that we can see planets around other stars. And right now we're finding planets that are all up to maybe two times or greater the mass of Jupiter. Um, but as technologies advance, we hope to be finding ever smaller planets by direct imaging uh, and learning more and more about them and learning about how our solar system falls too. We can follow them in time and have an accurate orbit. And with the orbit of these planets, we can have a good idea of what is around them because they might not be alone. Uh, so with, within the dashed uh, white circle, uh, this is where most of the um, artifacts from, from, from the instrument are blocked, uh, are preventing us from discovering anything further. But uh, by monitoring that little planet that is marked with the B letter, uh, we can have a first clue of if there could be anything. And if there could be anything within that circle that could be rocky planets like ours. So for future generation of telescopes and instrumentation, uh, it would be very valuable if right now we could identify the prime targets where to look for those uh, Earth-like planets so we could image them eventually. 
And, and yeah, the, most of the work that Gemini is doing in this field right now is using an instrument called the Gemini Planet Imager, or GPI, GPI, GPI. Uh, and that's at Gemini South in Chile. And uh, so it can do, it's a, a remarkably powerful instrument for uh, studying and discovering uh, planets around other stars. So we're very excited about uh, the potential for that uh, in the future. Uh, and then looking out beyond the, our nearby universe, our solar system and planets around other nearby stars, looking at other galaxies. And I think that ties in real well with what we're talking about here. Uh, since the contest, the poll, um, resulted in observing an individual galaxy. And uh, here we're looking at... What's that? I said, absolutely, thank you very much for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here we have a picture of an individual galaxy. This is one of my favorites here. This is what's called a ring galaxy. And what we think ha is happening here is that it's gal two galaxies also colliding. Uh, and it, uh, it's thought that there was a, a smaller galaxy that sort of pierced the heart of this galaxy and caused it a disturbance. And that disturbance you can see around that, that ring of, of red glowing clouds. Those are clouds of glowing hydrogen gas where stars are forming. And when galaxies collide, it's not like something hitting a solid wall. Galaxies are mostly empty space. So they kind of pass through each other, kind of like what you might think a ghost going through something, right? Um, but they, but they disturb each other gravitationally and they cause distortions and, and all kinds of interesting to things to happen over time. Now, the time we're talking about is thousands, millions of years for it to really be develop into something interesting. Uh, but uh, what we're looking at here, we think, is the result of one of those uh, galactic collisions uh, and uh, making what's called a ring galaxy. And so that ring of, of, of star formation around the edge is the result uh, because of that disturbance. So this is a really interesting galaxy, one of my favorites. Uh, that, that, um, um, and um, so once, once we get the image from Australia, we'll have another, I'm sure, interesting galaxy to talk about. <laughs> and this is the telescope at night um, from inside. Um, you can see that yellow beam like a pencil sticking up out of the top. That's a laser that we use to help make corrections when we use adaptive optics. Uh, basically, it's, it makes an artificial star in the sky that we can use to sample to figure out what the distortions are like in the, what the turbulence is like in the atmosphere and how it's distorting uh, the light from the objects that we're looking at so that we can make corrections and take those distortions out. And again, that's called adaptive optics. And here it is from the outside, again, with the laser pointing up in the Milky Way um, um, going across the sky. Um, and um, I believe that that is the end of my slides, and I'll come back now. Just to and, make sure, this uh, laser is not reaching uh, the stars we're observing or the galaxies we're observing. The laser is barely getting into our Earth atmosphere, so it glows, and we can observe... Um, the light coming back to us so it's not like if we need to point the laser to what we're observing we're we're pointing towards where we're observing and it's the earth atmosphere who shines back to us so we can sample what our atmosphere is doing so we can correct for it yeah we're using what's called a sodium laser you notice like color was kind of an orangish color kind of like sodium street lights uh and what's happening is that about 90 kilometers up uh there's a layer of sodium that sort of just hangs out there. And it keeps getting replenished by meteors when they come up in the atmosphere. And they leave a little bit of sodium behind. And um, that's what we're, that's what we see. Oh, that's what the, the laser um, excites and causes an artificial star to be formed wherever we want one. Now, the joke I like to make is that um, there aren't enough stars in the, in, the, in, the, in the universe for astronomy they have to make their own. <laughs> so uh, oftentimes there's not a star in just the right place. It has to be very close to the object that you're trying to study so that you can get the best corrections and, and get the best image. So, um, Elena, questions? that's that's all I have for slides. Um, if we want to, do you have any more questions? Maybe can we just take a quick little look around your your uh, fabulous Gemini office here? <laughs> okay, yeah, let me, we're, we've, we've got our, our computer here on a chair, and so um, Andre Nikolai is turning on the screen, so those are a bunch of control screens, 
And here we are. Let's see, I'll hang it up here. We've got some screens over here that show us um, what's happening in the sky and weather and all of those sorts of things. So we can monitor that from down here. And there's Alexis, our intern, who is uh, going to post some social media things today from our event. And more screens over here. Um, and then if we keep going around, more and more screens. We've got screens everywhere. The question that people might have is, why do you need that many screens? I, do, I just have one and I can do everything I want with it. Um, uh, the answer to that is the following. Um, we, need, we need space for visual uh, dis display so we can react quickly to uh, anything that happens because we requested it or things that might happen like uh, unpredictable issues. So the quickest we look at things and the quickest we can assess what's going on, the better is our work. Um, so we spread things over different screens. So in one look, we have a good idea of what's going on. And we have a set of screens for every person that is involved in the work. So the, the, the seat we're sitting on is for the observer. The observer is responsible for controlling the instrument and deciding where, where to point the telescope. Then on the other side in front, there is the, the, the of the operator. The operator is responsible for the telescope, the dome, and it's the person that does move things after the observer um, asks the request to point somewhere. And the operator has to make sure that all the systems controlling the mirrors, controlling the telescope, controlling the dome, everything is working smoothly and as, uh, as expected. Uh, both the operator and the observer are looking at the weather conditions, making sure that there's no cloud that is coming in, blocking the way and have, uh, forcing us to change plans. And we have extra stations. Uh, sometimes the uh, observer and the operator needs, need assistance from an external person, an extra person. And that would happen mostly when we use the laser, so that big beam that we uh, propagate on uh, our um, atmosphere needs to be uh, taken care of very carefully by a professional, by an engineer, that uh, checks all the system because lasers are very complex and sensitive machines that have to be uh, um, uh, used with a lot of care and a lot, a lot of love um, to, to work uh, correctly. So you might have two to three to five people in this room, everybody controlling a different thing and everybody responsible for a different thing. So those displays are kind of vital. We like to keep them to a minimum useful but we don't want to have too few. We want to be able to see things quickly. It's kind of like a mini version of mission control when a, when a rocket gets launched. Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> we have a lot of different systems that we can do a to make sure everything works. Uh, because if one of those systems breaks down, that could prevent us from making an observation. Sometimes they're which are time critical, and if we miss it, we will never get another chance. Yep. So. Um, it um, can be a very active place in here. Uh, and in fact, about the time we get done with this session today, it's going to start getting active as people start getting ready for tonight, just to make sure everything's ready to go so that uh, uh, we can be on the sky uh, once the sun goes down. Oh, wonderful. Hey, this, is, uh, this is Richard. So I have, I have a question. Um, hi. So you guys aren't at the telescope right now, are you? We're not. No, we're at the base facility here at Hilo, and, uh, which, is, which is, like I said uh, before, where it's all operated from now. Um, uh, with the remote operations, um, we base, typically will have nobody on the mountain. Uh, it would be an exceptional case now where we'd have anybody up on the mountain during the night. It all happens from down here anyway. So this is, <coughs> the, um, this is the place to be. <laughs> Well, your image up there. Uh, we should probably uh, we should probably think about wrapping this up um, pretty shortly, um, and uh, uh, going ahead and stopping the recording at least part of the video. Okay. Uh, uh, I guess um, just from everybody 